All right, it's five o'clock. Let's stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United States of America, the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> okay, just want to announce that Neil is joining us uh, remotely. Hi, Neil. And um, that will bring, bring me to number three on the open forum. Is there anyone that would like to address the school board this evening? Okay, seeing none. Uh, we, number four, a public hearing regarding tax abatement for new home construction program. We have a uh, resolution that uh, the board is going to be asked to approve later on in the agenda. Um, for the abatement. Um, you can see the uh, property owners there. So this is just an open period to have for the board to hear from the public if there's any thoughts or comments on the, okay. the abatement. Any, any uh, public input? Okay. Seeing none, we'll cover that in 11, it looks like. Um, number five, um, our school board member our new one isn't here yet. Uh, she's probably still at soccer practice, so you can probably we'll move that a little later and okay. she comes in. Okay, sounds good. Go to that. Okay, um, approval of today's agenda. So moved. Ken so moved. Second. Second by Kim. Any discussion on that? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Oppose the same sign. Okay, uh, agenda is approved. Number seven, consent items. We need to pull out the uh, pep band and show choir from the uh, consent items tonight. We're not sure we're going to be allowed to have those this year, so it's best just to pull them at this point. We'd add them on then later if it came up. Okay. Uh, looking for a motion to uh, accept the consent, or I'm sorry, approve the consent items minus again the pep band and show choir. In a second, any uh, discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed the same? Okay, consent is approved. Uh, reports, number eight, uh, Superintendent, Dr. Funk. So, ask you the first thing I'd like you to do is, yeah, just scroll down a little bit on that page there. Keep on going. Okay. So, Couple, there's four different dials I want to just draw your attention to on this page. Uh, the first one is the bottom number there, and that is 25 is the total number of cases we've had in Albert Lee uh, School District since the start of the school year. The number above that is the current number of cases that we have within the school system, um, and that number is six. So we have dropped considerably since last week uh, the number of cases. Now go up to the top here a little bit, Ashley. And there's, there's numbers that uh, are on here. Uh, these are the county numbers. And the county numbers say that there's 20.64 people as of last Thursday um, out of the, out of the uh, um, per 10,000 people in the county that uh, um, tested positive for COVID. So these numbers are concerning to me because they are trending upward while our current numbers are trending downward. So I had a conversation with the Department of Health last Wednesday with our COVID team, myself, the school nurses, and Kathy. And we asked the question that numbers were bad two weeks ago, but there's a two-week lag in the the reportable numbers. So our numbers this Thursday are probably going to be higher than this number. And so what would that mean, particularly for the elementary? Um, would that change us into a different learning format? And their comment was, this is just one factor that the school district can use in their decision making. These numbers were used to start the school year. Uh, the situation on the ground um, determined working with your local um, Healthcare providers, county health, our nurses determine um, much more than just a number that, that was 
developed over a two-week period. So what I'm saying today is this number is likely to go up on Thursday a few points, and according to what we're seeing with our, our students um, within the district, um, we are going to more than likely maintain our current model of education. Uh, we have, uh, we're starting our sixth week of school. We've had zero student cases within the elementary. We've had two at the middle school, and the rest have been at Alberley High School. And um, so if the community sees that if that number is greater than 20 and continuing to go up for, for at least this week, um, unless we see a spike in cases within the elementary, um, we're likely to stay within our same model. I just wanted the, the board to be aware that, um, that we look at a lot of factors, not just that number when we're going into the decision making. Um, I also want to thank all of our, our staff, uh, especially our nursing staff who have been working just great, great hours uh, making sure our kids are safe, our custodians who've been cleaning our buildings, uh, bus monitors and our, and our drivers uh, for, for keeping us safe. Uh, you know, I think we're, it's really good that uh, we're this far into the school year um, and we've had a few spikes within the community, but um, you know, it's just the fact that we're in school I think is a, is a good thing. A couple other things here, free meals have started again for all students K-12 um, and they will be through the remainder, come on in Esther, um, they will be for the remainder of the, the calendar year. Okay, we don't know what's going to happen after the holidays, but uh, through the remainder of the calendar year, we will still have them. Uh, we began credit recovery today at Albert Lee High School, so that's a, a good sign. Um, targeted services, we're on hold yet. We still haven't figured out how we're going to do that yet. Um, we're going to probably wait through the first quarter here to make a decision on what we're going to do with the after-school targeted program. We did a survey on distance learning through the first half of the quarter. I haven't had a chance to review that data yet, but uh, we might bring that to the board just for your review next Monday at our study session. Um, high school will be sending on a survey as well to see how their hybrid approach is working. The open window to switch between learning models for students and families started on Friday and is open through this Thursday. So far, we've had 40 responses. 28 of them are coming back on site and 12 are going to distance learning and I don't have breakdown by, by what grade level that is. And then uh, activities wise, uh, as you're, when we'll talk State High School League a little bit tonight later, but now they've allowed football and volleyball to take place and they are starting their seasons tonight, they're practicing. So um, that is my report for this evening. School board reports that start with Dennis. Uh, meetings are starting to happen again at Bailey. Kim was at the business club meeting. So I got that covered. She'll cover that. And then um, we had the worksite wellness meeting. Uh, one of the key takeaways, and I think SHIP is already working with the school district, but one of the things that they got approved was portable hand washing stations. One of the niceties with that for moving around is get away from just the hand sanitizer and the, the thorough cleaning. So uh, businesses are able to apply. I believe the schools are looking through and uh, trying to figure out uh, the best way to manage that. But they think that's a, a positive solution and, and availability for some of the different events and activities. Uh, I did want to put in uh, Mike Moore passed away uh, a week ago, and just knowing this is 20 years ago that the Elberly High School was built, uh, Mike Moore was one of the mainstays on that, and just the community work and efforts that he did, um, his memorials, he wants going to the Education Foundation as well as a couple other entities, but um, if you can keep Mike and his family in your thoughts and prayers, uh, phenomenal person, but I think it's uh, really important to recognize that for what he's done to the school district and community. Yep. Thank you, Dennis. Can't. Can't. Nothing to report. Teal? 
Uh, no meetings to report, but the uh, grad banners have now been um, taken down and the pickup is happening right now at Edgewater Park. And uh, we heard a lot of good comments from the community about that. And we are thankful for community support for the grad banners. Thank you for the doing that. Kim. Yeah, so um, I did attend the business ed committee. I think Neil was there as well. And we, a lot of things are on pause right now because a lot of the work we do on that committee is ideally face-to-face -face are offering opportunities and we are not able to do that. But one of the things that we talked about that affects the district um, specifically is the, the business ed committee wanting to work with the ed foundation, the education foundation, and the school districts on the Albert Lee Greater Education Project. Um, and that has to do with getting into the schools and working with eighth graders and I believe it's seniors in some apprentice opportunities as well as speakers coming in to, to meet with the eighth graders. And I think a lot of people have done that in the community. Um, Jean Eaton is is kind of been tasked with that. But there's just um, opportunities for us and we've met with, on the Education Foundation side, Neil and I had an opportunity to meet with Mike and just see where we're at with the school district on that as well. So a lot of work behind the scenes and hopefully soon we'll have uh, a larger report on how we're gonna move that program forward. It's a perfect time to be doing this right now because of the, um, the fact that we can't be in front of the students. And so taking that pause, looking at the program, how can it grow? Um, we're, we're doing that in both those areas. So, um, and then the only other thing I wanted to, to let the board know is that as um, a representative um, to the Minnesota State High School League from this board, now I didn't represent the board, I represented myself as a school board member, but I sent a letter to the Minnesota State High School League, the chair, or the executive director, um, just about my concerns, and we're gonna talk about this later, but I just thought the board should know that I sent that letter, a letter from me about that, so. Good. That's it. Thank you. Um, I attended the uh, finance committee meeting, and I know we'll go through that here shortly, and then also was uh, contacted by MSBA to be an area delegate for us now, which will be a, a voting delegate. So uh, that will start, I think December is the first meeting, and. If we want to put together resolutions that we would like to have happen at the state, we can do that at the board level and then go to the delegate level, then it continues from there. So that would be it for me. How about Neil? What's that? Neil. Oh, Neil. Hi, young yeah. man. How's the girls? C can you hear me? Gotcha. All right. Uh, well, I have nothing to report since Kim covered this topic pretty well. We're both very active in the Education Foundation, and uh, we have some, th some things going there. And Kim outlined them pretty well. So that's it for me. All right. Thank you. Well, before I go any further, Esther, would you come up, please? So as I get to that, uh, now we have student reports. Go ahead, Aaron, I'll give you first shot. Or is he gonna make Esther do it? I don't know. I was thinking, <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna give her something to follow here. <laughs> Uh, 
Hello, everyone. So first, I want to say welcome, Esther, as our new uh, junior class school board rep. I think being on the Albert Lee School Board as a student rep is a very rewarding education, educational and humbling opportunity experience uh, to represent your peers on the school board. And I hope you enjoy it just as much as I have, if not more. So again, just congratulations. Um, the only thing I have to report is, obviously, you heard of a couple cases at the high school that popped up this last week, forcing all of us to move to a full distance learning model for the week. I'm glad to say I was back in school uh, in person today, and I know a lot of people were very happy that we were able to do that. So just thanks to everyone that was able to make that happen and make it so that we can, it was a very, very short break and then we could return to school in a timely and safe manner. So thank you. I think you've all seen the packet that uh, was sent uh, a few weeks ago. I forwarded it on prior to the board meeting here. Um, there's sticker shock throughout the state of Minnesota right now on the, the fees for the uh, state high school league. So as you can see on the, on the uh, screen up there, Ashley, can you help us with, there you go. Uh, our normal invoice is around $5,000 for a year of fees for the State High School League. Um, they are almost tripling that um, because of the COVID situation this year, um, going from $5,000 to just under $14,000. Um, and a lot of concerns statewide. Um, over the significant amount of the increase. Um, I, I sat on a conference call with the State High School League Executive Director and his team earlier today. And, you know, to be fair, from a revenue angle, I mean, they're short about $600,000 from having to cancel their uh, um, tournaments this winter. Um, so they are really short revenue. Um, however, significant increase like this when it's a tight environment is uh, um, it's, it's hard for districts all over the state. And the other thing that is concerning is, um, I'll just speak for myself here, uh, the back and forth message on whether we're going to have sports or not. Um, you know, this spring they wouldn't make a decision until probably June that we weren't going to have any sports. This fall, they said we weren't going to have football and volleyball. They then changed their mind about a week ago, and now we are going to have football and volleyball. For the sports that we did start the school year with, to include tennis, swimming, boys and girls soccer, we still don't know if we're going to have section tournaments yet. We still don't know if there's going to be a tournament past the section level yet. Um, just a lot of... Um, not a lot of direction we're receiving from the State High School League. And the only direction we're getting is we want you to pay, um, you know, essentially this much more money. Um, so uh, I have a, you know, I try to do my best job of being fiscally responsible for the district. And this is a, uh, this is a tough one because, uh, you know, I think the State High School League does a lot of good things and it's good things for our students. But uh, anyhow, so that's my two cents on it. And uh, um, I'm open to any sort of discussion before the board chooses to take any action on this. Uh, I'm going to call on Neil first as our uh, best expert on this with your years of experience. I know you've been thinking about this, and then I'll come back, Ken, but I don't want to forget you, Neil. Go ahead. Any thoughts? Well, yeah, I, it, it is a significant increase in a, at a very bad time for school districts. I, I guess my first question would be, what if we don't agree to pay that fee and, and join high school? What are the consequences of that? 
since I don't know if we're having any section or state tournaments this year, I don't know at this point. I mean, if you know, they haven't told us what they're going to do yet. Um, we don't know. I have no idea what the future is. So if they told us that they weren't going to have any tournaments, then maybe you wouldn't that be that important to be part of the state high school league this year. Um, but what, you know, I think of our kids who do compete at the section or the state level. Um, the, the risk would be hurting the, those students. But again, I don't know if we're going to be competing there. Ken, go ahead. I guess a question I would have is what have the other big nine schools said about this situation? I think they're not happy with it, but I think they're going to pay it. Well, for me, it's especially disappointing when we look at, we, we just had conversation on controlling our activity fees and trying to get more kids involved in everything. And then, uh, you know, I think that's something that we as a board, we all wanted. And now we have uh, extra expenses. Any, it, the superintendents, state superintendent association? The, one of the concerns with the state high school league is there's represent there's representatives at different levels of education with on the board on the state high school league board um i think does the school board have association have a representative msba has two uh, at large which are coming up this year yes. okay so the principals association has representatives the ad's have representatives there are no official seats for superintendents on the uh, state high school league board so a few years ago, they, the Superintendent Association tried to get some seats, but 75% of the state high school league membership has to vote on something, and they didn't. 75% didn't didn't participate in the vote, so the superintendents never got seated. And and from just my perspective, your most fiscally responsible people are most likely to be superintendents on that uh, on that board. Uh, so. So they're trying to, part of the discussion today was, well, maybe we can try to work something out so we can get superintendents on the board. I think that's what they're trying to say is, okay, you guys pay the fees, maybe we'll allow districts to have superintendent representation. Dennis. Um, a couple questions. Number one, the state high school, the Minnesota State High School League, are they their own entity? So they, they're yes. from the state, the school district? Yes. Mini NCAA. Okay. And then, so with that, what accommodations have they made? Um, from what I see, there's layers and layers and layers of staff there. And if they're not making any effort, and we're going to have to pay out all this money, and we don't know if there's going to be any tournaments, it's frustrating. Um, the sense I got from some connections in the cities and other places is that decision was based off of parents <coughs> really pushing and pressing that they wanted football so that their kids still could go to college. And although well and good from a safety standpoint, they said no, and now you're turning around and saying yes. Now you're going to affect the winter sports season, so you're impeding on that. There's, they can't take a stand on anything, and that's not, that's not good. It's just back and forth, and they're a business then, their own entity. They, they got to stand for and I don't know how the impact is here, but we do have students who went out for a different sport this fall because there was their only option. And now suddenly they may be in a different sport and now they may be asked to, okay, now football or volleyball has now started. Is it? reflects um, you know. um, my, my, my question on, on the fees of the $4,500 is that supposedly two one-time fees too have you heard anything more about that is it or is that have they just call it the COVID fees or is that going to continue onward I can't tell you I think it's at least it's these two fees are one time at this point but I don't know what the I don't know what the future is going to look like. When I was talking with Paul, um, just to get more background, he had indicated that an increase in fees had gone 
had they had an increase in fees for for last year. So this would be an additional increase in fees. Um, yeah. I challenge that too as well in my letter about you know infrastructure at the league. You know what have they done to take a look at that? Also, the representation from Greater Minnesota is is not great no. on that board, um, and so I asked about you know that piece, and also the reach they have there hasn't been a reach, and I don't know you were a representative before. There's no correspondence with us no. at all, no. No. and so that's an opportunity, in my opinion, to be connected to the districts, right? If you would reach out to those members on the board that have been appointed to be a representative to to that. It sounds like there are sp specific duties. If there was a if there was a grievance that happened, or I mean, really just small kind of duties for this representative. But it, I feel like that's an that's a built-in committee, right? Subcommittee to to help with this narrative and get support from the districts. I I worry about if we don't. I feel like there should be accountability at the league level, but I. I also know that I feel that if we don't pay it, there are students that potentially this would affect students, and I, I I'm concerned about that. But I'm I'm my letter was more about you know this is just this is not setting a great example when districts have to we have to have a a fund balance. You know there's if you look at their what I would say in quotes mismanagement of funds up to this point. They don't have that fallback opportunity that their that districts are, you know, and nobody's holding them accountable because they are their own entity. So, is it not part of the state high school league? Um, say a student qualifies in some event, are they not allowed to participate then? Yeah. Correct. Well, what is is there um. Is there a, and I should know this, ind there, there's independent status within the MSHSL, isn't there? I don't know. I, I can just, find out. I, my, only, my only wonderings is if, you know, if there is, if they have a set fee schedule that all of a sudden we said, hey, we're going to pay our forty nine ninety nine like we expected to. But for the other fees, you know, if we qualify kids, if it's $500 to send someone on, it's cheaper than $9,000 in long, just back of my mind. I don't think they'll do that, but I didn't think that's that's a little too complicated. So, what do they need all this funding for? To run the tournaments themselves, or what? I'm not real clear. There's a shortfall of money. So my thought is, if we're not, if we don't think we're going to be able to hold tournaments, and I don't think you're going to be able to hold tournaments when you're limited to 250 people at an outdoor event. Um, and no people inside, um, then I think you should plan for the year ahead that, guess what, we may have to furlough some people. Um, I, I, I just, I, I think they're just trying to make up for the revenue difference. That's my thought too, and I had that same, I, you know, the same wondering what are they doing about their own um, level of staffing and just throwing that burden on to school districts does not seem right to me. We were having an extra $9,000 fees so times that by 67 other districts, that's your 600 right there. I think they're gonna have, I mean, the school districts are not an open pocketbook for for anyone, including this league. I could see even maybe doubling it, but but tripling it is, it doesn't, it, to me, it doesn't seem justified. And I, I can understand the impact on um, students and, I know students in the spring as well were very, um, very upset that they weren't able to have their normal season and an end to that. Um, and it just, it just makes me wonder if we can't just have an informal agreement between districts to do our own tournament at the end of the season and forego this this year. You know, uh, question I would have. Can you not join one time and join the other? 
Probably not, but I can ask the question. Dennis. So strategically, there's, there's a couple different things going on. One of the reasons they are coming back with football, and not football per se, per se, but volleyball, is people are playing J.O. volleyball. Okay, we'll just go play somewhere else. So the concern is if, if club sports start to take off and start to go do their own thing, then that may impact the long-term viability of the state high school league you know outside entities will, will, will pick that up the second thing is tv revenue uh, right now in albert lee you can watch pretty much any sport that we offer on live stream on the internet so where's the tv revenue going to go when suddenly you can watch it online for free and you don't have to tune in to channel watch so and so anymore. Um, so we think they're going to start taxing online streaming as part of their. But but again, that's I don't think their TV revenue is going to be as high as it historically has been either. I don't see these fees. I mean, I think this is a huge jump. And they talk somewhere in the letter about well, you know, maybe we can give money back or they're going to go yeah. down. I don't see that happening in the future. I think this model is just a shaky model moving forward. I guess what's frustrating Dave. is we're probably getting less from them right now with the less tournaments while we're getting more, while we're expected to pay a lot more. But and then it goes back to we don't, don't want to hurt the kids in case there's those tournaments, which we don't even know are going to happen, and that's the reason we have to pay more in the first place, according to them. It's just got, it's kind of a vicious circle here. Hmm. Neil. Yeah. Um, the high school league serves a, a, what I consider to be a very, very necessary function. They are the governing body. They are the ones who orchestrate the rules and the regulations for participation among all uh, schools, virtually all sco schools in Minnesota. And uh, that's one thing they do, and, I, and that's, a, that's a very useful program, uh, and especially uh, Lately, they have become very much involved in promoting the educational aspects of activities, and I'm a, I've been a huge advocate of that for many years. And, and they do a pretty decent job of serving as a, not just a governing body in terms of rules and regulations and procedures, but also promoting educational aspects of activities, and that's good. They also are the entity that, that orchestrates the uh, postseason activities, the state tournaments. They become the managers of all of that. And that is another function that's, if we, and I think, you know, we all agree that uh, end of season tournaments, uh, progressions from the uh, se sectional, well, we used to call them sec district regions and then state, now it's sectional and uh, the state, uh, all of that is governed by the high school league, and, and it's, somebody has to do that, and, uh, and uh, it's, that's a big part of their function. Now, there are tremendous costs involved in that in terms of arranging for venues for the, these activities, paying all the help, the officials, the, the uh, work, uh, everybody that works at these terms. You know, we could uh, brown bag it, I suppose, and do that all ourselves and hold the events in our in local school facilities, but we wouldn't have the seating. I, I know in, in uh, wrestling, which is, of course, what I'm most familiar with, uh, I can remember uh, over 50 years ago when 
the state tournament was held at a, at a college like Gustavus Adolphus. It was held at Mankato State. And I suppose that probably didn't cost as much as the XL Center, which is, I'm sure that venue has fantastic costs. <clears throat> but, you know, back in, in the good old days, we maybe had 3,000 people in attendance at the event, and it was a two-day event, uh, Friday evening and, and all day Saturday. Now mm -hmm. it's a three-day event, and and uh, I think four, I don't know, four, in way, way more attendance. So they sell a lot of tickets. They have TV uh, right income. Uh, it's a big business. Now, maybe it's not necessary for a football tournament to be p p uh, p played in the same uh, uh, arena that the Vikings play. You know, it's it's nice, but, but uh, I'm sure it's very expensive. I, I would assume we could probably cut down on the expenses a lot, and the the uh, organization, high school league, could probably uh, tone down its approach to things. Um, I don't know, but I'm, and I'm I'm quite certain that their their uh, the urgency, their financial urgency right now is 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 a result of if they're going to conduct postseason events and and they have to have a, a site for the for those events to take place and at the same time you know um, it professional teams are doing this because they have television that uh, which generates a lot of money to pay for the events and pay the bills high school league doesn't have that you know if they have to to rent uh, the XL Center for a state tournament, and they, and they can't sell tickets to fans. Well, I'm sure that's probably where their their uh, lack of funds is coming from this year. I a little bit concerned that if if things ever do get back to normal again, and th this level of uh, dues and fees ha has been established, that uh, you know. I, I would I would not be convinced that they were going that they would go back to you know what we were paying previously. Without the high school league as a governing body, I, I'd, I see the uh, probably the only other alternative would be we uh, schools would be following perhaps a, a European model where activities are not a part of the school programs; uh, they're part of clubs. Uh, and uh, order, and then those clubs and organizations serve, uh, provide the the uh, superstructure for in infrastructure for postseason events, and uh, they take care of all the management. I'm a little nervous about that. I really would like to have activities as a part of our educational program, as opposed to clubs and organizations over which uh, sc our, our school districts would have no control whatsoever. And uh, I'd, I'd be very nervous about that arrangement. So I'd, I'm at a loss to, I, I really don't like the, the prospect of paying the kind of money that's that's being suggested. But on the other hand, I, I don't much care for the prospect of the high school league going out of business either. So I, I'm afraid I'm not much help. Okay. Well, my opinion is that we can pay the forty or the five thousand, and we wait on the other fees till we get more information. You could put that into a motion for me. I'll if put you. that into a motion. Okay. So is, Ken is, makes. Is that is that acceptable? Is that is? What? Well, I'm sorry. It's, we open for discussion now. Not yet. We've got to get a second on it. We need a second. Yeah. Okay, we've got a motion and a second to pay the $49.99 uh, to the Minnesota State High School League now. Neil, what would you like to say? I'll come to you yeah, first. Yeah, would that, how, uh, is that an option uh, from the point of view of the high school league? It, it, it says that the bill... It establish a fee structure and then we say we'll pay part of that fee. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm it, just wondering how that would work out. It says it's not due I, until I like, November 30th. I like that the first one is not due until November 30th, and the second one isn't due until February 28th. So a couple, couple thoughts on that. 
I think they're meeting October 1st, which is sometime later this week, to determine what the rest of the fall season will look like. So we have a board meeting on Monday night. I'll at least have information for you Monday that I could share with you on, okay, what our fall is going to look like. I have not heard anything yet about what the winter is going to look like. So I don't know if they're going to make that decision at that point or not. So you certainly could. It, I think it'd be prudent to approve the first payment, and then you can find out a little bit more to find out Monday. I can tell you what that's going to look like. And then when we find out what the winters are going to look like, we could do that. Now, the second thing, and this is why they're doing it, okay, the, the federal government has given COVID money to school districts because of the COVID environment that we are living in to help pay for shortfalls. And so they're just saying, use the COVID money that the feds gave you to pay the, pay the extra fee. But you got to pay it by December 31st because we have to expend this down, the, the money by December 31st. So that's part of the, uh, and, and she's already, Jennifer and I have already talked, and I said, if we have that, let's set some aside for this just in case. So you can certainly approve the one tonight. You can do anything you want, but I mean, so if you decide you're going to pay, I would encourage you to pay by December 31st. So, I mean, we can revisit this a few times this fall. Um, that way we can use the federal dollars for it if need be. Dennis. I like the idea of paying the August invoice total and then waiting to get more communication back from them. What have they done? We have the budget figures, but they didn't tell us what they cut or what they changed. Have they changed anything? We don't know that. And um, so there's going to be all kinds of can of worms out there. If we got 75-year-old referees repping on the sideline. The fan or the, the team and the players don't stay back. That, that referee all of a sudden gets sick. He's liable. I mean, there's just so many catch-22s in it. And have they have they followed the logic on all of the things? And if they have, communicate it to us so we know what's going on. And I would like to request that in a in a communication from us as a school board to the to the league. I would like to know these things and to express our our um, concerns with this situation because we are not the only district in this situation. And yes, we have COVID money, but do we want to just dump it there? We, there are other real concerns that we have invested COVID money into for the safety of our students. So have they considered other venues? Have they considered cutting staff? What What are they doing to help our students and the students of Minnesota? It, it looked like the... Uh probably attrition took about four or five of their people out. Maybe they cut a position and then they commented about saving on printing costs. Well, when you don't have to print tickets and you don't have to print programs. <laughs> so really, I agree, Jill. They, I don't know what they've really done to help out the situation. Yeah, if you go to a game now, you get uh, just like a carnival ticket and you used to get like printed tickets from them. But I, I agree. I think we could make the statement that you know, if we pay this, we would make some kind of, we would send kind of cor a correspondence with them that, hey, you know, this is kind of bullet out our concerns about this. And I, I personally don't feel, I can see that if we have that COVID money, we'd want to spend it. But I feel like they're taking advantage of that situation in that that money was, is, is about the students and, and serving the students in the classroom, in my opinion and helping us as a district be able to do that, not pay for short, shortfalls with agencies that support the work we do. You know, so I, I feel like, I get, I get it, but I feel like that's not, that's not good process for us. But I think, you know, if we can come up with some bullets under that and, and say, you know, we want a response before we vote on the, the other areas, that would be my opinion. The good thing is we have time to come back and vote and pay uh, the rest of the fee um, and with the COVID money that's still available, but let's, let's get the information we need. Hey, Dave. Yes, sir. I, 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 I'm a, I support this motion not because the, the amount that we would be spending is in the neighborhood of what we are used to spending. And uh, 
you know, this uh, pandemic ha has uh, done a lot of things, and I, I, one of the things that it's accomplished is to identify how well an organization can cope in the face of, of uh, hardships and crises. And uh, I agree with Dennis. Uh, I think the high school week has revealed a, a fairly significant and troubling inadequacy, and they need to get their act together. They're, I, I, I'm aware of this because I'm a, I'm a coach and I'm, I'm involved. I have dealings with the high school league relative to that area, and I'm an official. Uh, and uh, boy, they have dropped the ball on a lot of things. Um, they just have not looked good in this situation. So yeah, let's get let's see if they can get their act together, um, pay the amount that uh, Ken specified, and uh, see what happens. Any other um, comments? What I'm going to do on this one is I'm going to make it a roll call vote to pay to for this. I'd like to do that because um, I'd like to be on record too where I want to vote on this to, uh, for Ken's motion of paying the $49.99 and leaving the $49.99 right now. You didn't say anything about anything later. So. And will we be sending a communication? Can we, would we add that to the motion? Yeah, let's, let's, would, would you? I'll make a, a motion to uh, amend the motion and that we wait on the other fees and till closer to the due dates when we get more information. And do you want to add anything about by 1231 that we? No. No. No, we don't need to, Okay. Okay. And the letter. Yep. Health of students, health of officials. Have you studied other venues besides the grand, you know, Excel and Target Center? And then cutting, uh, a discussion on cutting or furloughing State High School League staff. Yep. Very good. It was, is there a second? Did you second Ken's amendment? Okay. All right. We have a motion and a second with the amendment. Um, I think we've got it. Uh, do we need to read it back, Ashley, just to make sure? It's All right, um, and I'm going to go ahead and poll this just because I'd like to. Neil. Aye. Dennis. Aye. Ken. Aye. Angie. Aye. Jill. Aye. Kim. Aye. And I for myself too. So that's a seven-zero vote. Good discussion. Thank you. Very good. Good motion. Okay, number two, uh, resolution of property tax abatement. Uh, Jennifer? Or my, I don't have my. Here we go. Can you pop up those properties? Uh, once again, this is an abatement for five years um, for people who are going to be building on a uh, couple of properties. I'll move approval. Okay. All right. Uh, approval in a second. Uh, we'll look discussion. 
Hearing none, um, all those in favor of approving the resolution of property tax abatement signify by saying aye. 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 Oppose, oppose the same sign. Okay. 2020-2021 district goals. Dr. Funk. We had a chance to discuss these at the other meeting. Um, we, the only one we did not have on here was the... Uh, the graduation goal, and as I stated in the board packet, I think we should update the uh, pathways document that we have throughout the district to incorporate uh, the new board goals within that, which will be the next item that I ask you to approve here. So my concern with that is um, um, not having the graduation rate as a goal and having it on the Pathways to success, uh, in my opinion, removes some of the accountability um, that we are giving ourselves as a district and as a board. Uh, to me, that would be more important than, say, number five, pass an operating levy. To me, that's business. <laughs> and the graduation rate is something that, um, that does affect our, our student body and our community as well. If we don't want to specify graduation rates on our goals, I would then like a goal that we would be um, uh, hitting the benchmarks that are specified on our pathways. Otherwise, we have this pathways document here that guides us, but there isn't really any accountability in it. And as one board member said last time, we could have a pie in the sky number on it, and it really doesn't matter because we're not um, hitting a lot of those benchmarks. So if we don't want to have graduation itself on the district goals, then I would like to see um, some acknowledgement of the pathways uh, benchmarks on the district goals for accountability's sake. Okay. I think I was the one that said we need to have realistic goals. And uh, I've always been told you have to be smart goals and they're specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound. And so I, I think that um, if we set goals, it should be for that this year. And I don't think it, the pathways document would be the, the right right one to use there. So, but I, I'm not, it says 80%. I'm not sure 80% sure is realistic, especially when we look at our, our COVID situation and students not in getting the, we hope they get the kind of education we want them to get, but I, I really question with the hybrid whether or not that's uh, gonna be effective in, helping us reach our goals. So uh, I guess if we're gonna add that, we need to come up with a realistic number. So, so two thoughts on that. We were at 80% two years ago. Okay, so it is pretty, it, it is, it's not outside the realm of realism for the district. Um, so, but I concur with the thoughts on the, on the COVID, um, the COVID piece. The pathways document is, for our staff, okay? These are targets for our staff. These are, okay, we want 80% of our students to hit growth targets regardless of where they start every year. Um, I think the current document says 90% for graduation, um, which, you know, which would be a complete stretch at this point. Um, so the, the pathways document is a document that our principals, myself, the director of teaching and learning, use to work with our staff on developing goals within what they do as far as uh, uh, the buildings and the classrooms. Okay? So, so they are utilized, and if there's an accountability mechanism in place, our staff feel that, uh, particularly the growth goal. Um, we use it, I can tell you when I sit down and go through evaluations with our principals, all right? Your building goal was 80% student growth, okay? Where did you end up? So you may not see the accountability on that at the board level, 
but it, it certainly is a document that we utilize within teaching and learning uh, within the school district. Um, you know, we, we can certainly have a, a, a goal on, the, uh, on this document to for, for a graduation rate, um, but I can tell you that th this is part of the, it, it's embedded into what we do within the Pathways document. Yes. Yeah, So my my thought on this is number one. So there are lots of there's a lot of benchmarking that happens. Graduation rate would just be one of those. I think there's some equity, and there's there's other benchmarking type in that pathway document that happen. And so for me, number one is the smart goal around all of that data. So I think that pathways document could be used as our measuring tool for number one, because there is graduation rates is, is important, but there's other things on that pathway document that are important as well. And I think that number one encompasses, in my opinion, what's, you know, that quality education piece for our students. That's what that pathway document, in my opinion, does. So I don't know, I think we could have six more goals up there and just pull over those pathway benchmarkings, really. But do we want to do that when we, when the number one, for me, number one is a smart goal because you're able to have the, da the data from that pathways document that can feed into that, that number one. That's how I look at it, I guess. And I guess I would like some kind of acknowledgement of that in this um, because um, I would like to maybe, um, you know, if it's embedded with staff accountability, I would like to raise that a little bit to superintendent and board accountability too because as a district, those are the, um, the measurements that we do want our students we want to set up our students for success and those are the measurements that we have uh, agreed to as a board and so I would like to increase that accountability to superintendent and board level. Um, my, I guess my big concern about the graduation rate, I think it should be a goal. It, I'd be okay if it was there, if it stays on the, on the pathways or success document, either way. Um, but I do think it's important. However, I also think, especially add COVID to it, it's, we talked, I think, at our last meeting or, um, about how, like, we don't get the graduation rate. Like, if a student graduates a year late because that they're just behind in credits, but they still graduate, or they graduated a year late or a year, two couple years later than expected because they were in, the, the special ed transition program, or they they graduated late because of ESL and, and they stayed and we, we did what was right by the district by either ensuring that students graduate even if it's later than traditionally expected. I think my I think graduation rate and, and getting kids to graduate on time and, and even even a year later, a couple years later than traditionally expected is is a good goal by just want to incorporate like the good things that the district does beyond their traditional quote unquote unexpected graduation rate that we do be above and beyond to make sure that these kids are successful. And, and I don't think that the 90% graduation rate here or even 80% or whatever we picked doesn't like encapsulate that. Like my bigger concern is like encapsulating what we're doing with those kids who are struggling or what we're doing with those kids that have extra needs that, you know, so we are making, we're going, sure, we're doing above and beyond.
to make sure they do graduate and they do have the skills that they need to be successful adults. So that's kind of, you know, I think a graduation rate is good and getting everyone, to, as many who can graduate on time is great as well. However, we need to account for that, like what the district is doing and what those students are doing to make sure that they're, that they, they end up graduating, even if it's not the traditional graduation date. Okay. Yeah, Neil. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, that, that 80% uh, percent or 85 or uh, whatever percent is a target for graduation goals is a very worthy goal for the student body to have. But for us as educators, what can, about the only control we have over that is to control the criteria for graduation. Uh, number one uh, on our list is a, a goal for which we are responsible, prepare the district to provide a quality education. That's a goal that's in the realm of all responsibility. Um, I, I don't know, really, uh, it sounds good to uh, have a goal of increasing our graduation rate, but what do we have to do with increasing our graduation rate? That's, that's the goal that students should have. Dennis? Well, we have goal number one, um, instead of prepare the district, we just say ensure the district provides quality education for all students using the pathway program in a pandemic environment. That, that, that's why the, the, it's sort of inherent in the statement that as it is, we can modify the statement, but that's, that's, our, that's our arena for uh, providing a quality education. I, I, you know, pandemic or no pandemic, um, regardless of what situation is that, the onus is on us to provide a quality education. The onus is on the students to graduate. And I think the pandemic environment just gives us some oh, opportunities yeah. because attainability is going to vary for every student with all the issues that are going on. Well, we're tying back to the pathways then because it's there. When we talk about the goals, we, we can say how are we achieving through the pathways. Yeah, if I may uh, comment on that, I, I, you know, I would like to see in, included in it this list of goals, something about vocational education and career education, but that's part of a quality education. I mean, all that is included in why, if, I, I think maybe you're right, Dennis, uh, using the, because our model is a pathways to success now, so let's mention that in, in, in connection with what we consider to be a quality education. So this is the current document um, that we've not adjusted for, but just a couple things in here. Um, so there's your growth targets. 90% of our students achieve their growth targets wherever they're at. Okay, we have 80% achievement levels. I can tell you what, if you want, if there's gonna be an adjustment for a pandemic environment, that achievement level will, will be adjusted down because what we're seeing from initial assessments, pre-screening is kids if, uh, are significantly back from, uh, from where they typically start the year. Neil, to your point on, uh, we have at the, on the right side of the screen there, we have student pathways based on interest and ability. And then just to the left of that, you see the 100% number. So in eighth grade, we want students to start working with their counselors at the high school to start to develop a plan for when they get into high school that really they can look at three different pathway opportunities. Um, your, your career tech pathway, your traditional, okay, I think I'm gonna go to college type pathway, and your AP, I'm really gonna go on and, and uh, you know, try to get into the Ivy Leagues or something like that pathway. So the students working with the counselors, working with the school, um, make those, um, working with their families, um, start to make those determinations 
at the eighth, ninth grade level, and they're pathways, so they're not necessarily locked into a track, but they're, they're pathways. And, and so um, that's kind of the overview of, of what the, the document is about. Um, and so we can throw on, put on here again, um, goal is 90% graduation rate, as you can see up there. We can certainly adjust that to 80% four-year graduation rate, 85% five-year graduation rate, you know, 90% six-year. Um, we could we could incorporate all those pieces to it. I would like that variable graduation rate for different years because I think it just shows like what we're doing and what those students are working hard to act, to graduate. It's still a goal and it's still a success. You know, I don't want to like discount those. So if we could do that, I would I would much like that. Okay, well, we are, we are still, and, and I know this probably incorporated uh, number four there a little bit, so we're still back on the district goals. If we want to um, <clears throat> make a motion on the ones you have, if we want to tweak the one you have, and then, or do we want to go in then later on, or next week, go into the pathways? And I like Angie's thought on that, maybe, or, or Dr. Funk on the four, five, and six year, maybe to uh, hone in a little bit on that pathways for the kids. So here's what I took down from Dennis for number one. Ensure district provides a quality education to the district, district's pathways of success program in a pandemic environment. I like that. Yep. I would move to approve the district goals for 2020-21 with the um, amendment to number one that Dr. Funk just read. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed the same. Okay, motion passed, number three. Then number four, in back at the uh, Pathways to Success document. And I so the, the recommendation that I would have there is to adjust that graduation rate to 80% for the district. And then we could certainly add on, as, as I just stated to, uh, to add, uh, Angie, 85% uh, five year, 90% six year, and we can, we can put, plug that in right up there. And for sake of space, we really don't, wouldn't need the five year. We could just do, do the four at 80 and the and the six at 90, right? Okay. okay. Yep. So 80% at four years, and then what was the last part? Uh, 90 for the six, or the final? Okay. Any other discussion or any other points that we want to put in for the pandemic? So Dennis? Saying, I think you, you alluded to it, the, the KG, the B, just on target. Um, do we have an idea? Mary Jo, do you want to do you want to talk at all? I shouldn't ask that question. I don't have the data in front of me, but it's significant. So when we did our case, did you see that thing? I think it was last year too. I just put it on my um, on staff of our staff. Um, we have very few kids who even complete the pathway. They have. I wouldn't, I, I, I need to provide you more data before we can make an adjustment to that, I think. Okay, okay. one other quick question, and I don't want to open up too much. On the 100% at grade eight, what do we use in there? Is, is there something that's in each kid's following? 100% is one of those great numbers that we like to have for everything, and that's pretty tough when 
there's a lot of variables that go to it. So what do we do? I mean, we're interviewing. Is this something that actually goes in their file that says you're on path one, two, three? We have a program called Naviance that uh, really it's a career, I don't know, it's a, it's a school planner that um, I think we've underutilized as a district to this point, and we've got some new counselors on board. Um, that can really help us um, work with our students as we're preparing them for life in high school. So that would be the tool we would utilize. I mean, it's, it's like pre-K. We all understand the uh, benefits of getting the kids as early as we can. That's why I've always really liked that, but thought 100% is tough, but how are we doing that? That's yeah, and, and the other thing is we have, this is where when we have the, the, the Pathways folks come in, the Greater uh, Elderly Education Project, eighth grade is where they get the speakers hit hard. Um, so they all have a Pathways course. Every student has, is part of a Pathways course that they take in eighth grade. Um, so again, these are all things that are incorporated into that course. We do have an action item. Do we want to, um, do we have any motions on any changes to the graduation rate on the Pathways to Success document? This item for a future um, okay. meeting. All right. Okay, uh, Jill would move that we postpone this item uh, and Angie second it. Any other discussion? Or, sorry, Kim. Sounds much alike. You look alike with a mask. Oh, never mind. Well, <laughs> sorry. Regressing at 6 p.m. Any other discussion on that? Yeah, hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Oppose the same sign. Motion passes. Um, number five, um, approval of the uh, adoption of the proposed 2020 pay 2021 certified levy at maximum. Jennifer. just because um, it's hard to read up here. <clears throat> so I think I'm just gonna kind of just go down to the bottom line first. Um, the overall increase right now on the proposed levy is $105,000. And just to give you a sense, that's a 1.17% increase. Then if we look back up into the, some of the detail, honestly, there's, <clears throat> there's not a lot of note here uh, next year, I am going to number these lines so it's a little easier to follow along as I talk. But you can see at the top, um, just based on our projections, a slight decrease of about five and a half students from one year to the next. My glasses are fogging, so I have to take my mask off for a minute. <laughs> Then moving down, uh, we see under the referendum market value, those levies that are distributed over that. And as a reminder, all properties are treated the same under the RMV, uh, and ag land is not part of this. The information I did not have when I gave this to Ashley last week to put on the um, agenda is that from the county I got on Sunday, that the tax base for the RMV is going up by 3.9%. So if you remember, we had this discussion a little bit last year. If the tax base is going up, we spread our levy out over a larger group. So even though our levy is going up, if the tax base goes up by a greater percent, chances are people will see little to no increase. A couple of items. Four, and I'm just going to, I'll look at the local optional revenue first because you do see an increase there. Really from one year to the next, the total amount we will be getting for LOR is about the same, but the mix between levy and state aid adjusted. So we're getting a little bit less in state aid, almost exactly equal to the amount of increase that we're seeing on our levy. So these are the items that are um, that are uh, that are put out over the referendum market value in that top section, and overall that increases $81,000. Again, as a reminder, we get an initial levy, and then throughout here you will see adjustments. So as 
information becomes more clear in subsequent years, for instance, our, what our enrollment actually was as opposed to what we think it's going to be, adjustments are made. The next section is levies that are distributed over the net tax capacity. And net tax capacity does treat different types of property differently. So residential property is taxed at one rate, uh, commercial is taxed at a different rate. House, acre, and garage is taxed at the same rate as residential, but then beyond that, ag land is taxed at a different rate. Again, the information that I just got Sunday um, determines that our net tax capacity tax base is increasing by about 2.4% between the two years. Uh, under the general fund, the items under the net tax capacity, uh, if you go down about, oh, it looks like about six lines, you can see that we did put in for an increase on unemployment insurance. Again, this will be adjusted when we see what our actual cost is for unemployment insurance. In early July, we got a very, very large invoice for unemployment insurance. For school districts, we are invoiced the, the amount that is actually paid out to individuals who receive some of their pay through us. Normally, our invoices per quarter are 15 to 20,000. That invoice was 70,000. We almost immediately got a retraction of that invoice saying, well, this is not correct we'll get back, basically we will get back to you. And so far we haven't, they have not gotten back to us. But we do anticipate that that amount might be higher than we normally see. Again, if it turns out that it's not, that will be a negative adjustment in future years. Uh, just as you can see, we had a negative adjustment for prior years included in this year's levy. Probably the other one of note, if you go down several more lines, you'll see the long-term facilities maintenance pay as you go increased by a fair amount. This gets a little confusing. We are gonna receive in total for LTFM almost exactly the same amount that we received last year. But part of our LTFM is going to pay bonds and part of it is pay as you go, so as we have projects. The shift between up in the general fund, the pay as you go, and then there's a shift down below in the debt service is when you look at all of the items combined between the general fund, LTFM pay as you go, the debt service, LTFM debt service, and, and I know this gets confusing, the difference between the total for general debt service and OPEB debt service comes out almost equal, which illustrates that really in total we're not getting any more, but it's just shifting of where we're seeing it in this, in this spreadsheet. So total um, general fund that is spread out over the NTC uh, is, 200, excuse me, 210,000. Then if you go down to community ed, that has actually uh, has a very small, slight decrease year over year. Most of community ed is based on population. Uh, so with the new census, this dollar amount may change, but we're still working off of the old census and so the dollar amounts tend to be very st st steady for community ed. And then again, moving on down, uh, when this OPEB bond, which you'll see further down, came off this year, as opposed to last year, we had about a $2.2 million payment for OPEB bonds last year. That was done. Now those payments are being shifted up into other debt service. And so the difference between those two is $183 million less than last year. And as you see, then that is very close to the amount 
that the LTFM maintenance pay as you go increased. Very clear, I know. <laughs> Gen Jennifer, what's the bottom line? Bottom line, that's why I started with that. Go bottom back to line, it. up 105,000 or 1.17%. 1.17% increase. And to give you an idea, the county just approved a 3%. The city tonight is approving a 7.94%. So I want to go through it a little bit, but uh, if you have questions, please feel free to ask. And just to be clear, I like how you put all these dates on the top uh -huh. because a lot of times people are wondering, what are we doing? Tonight? I know, what, yeah, so why are we doing is, this now? We're just, tonight we're just setting that this is the maximum that will go and we'll revisit this in December for the final yes. vote. Thank you. Now, and we have to approve this at the maximum because if our referendum would pass, this would go up. If we don't approve it at the maximum and the referendum passes, we wouldn't be able to recognize that revenue. So it's important that we approve this at the maximum, uh, which allows us, if we do have a vote, uh, an affirmative vote, that we could recognize that in the levy. I make a motion that we uh, go along with the presentation and have the 1.17 percent. <laughs> Approval at the max? Yeah. Prove it at the max. Next year, I'll just start with the bottom line <laughs> and then see if you have any questions. Um, I do want to maybe, Ashley, if you could bring up the amount uh, on a $100,000 house. So, Jennifer, I think we should all acknowledge that the way that you, you present it is clearer than maybe we had, we had thought about it in the past. So not that anybody was doing anything wrong with this. This You're doing well presenting it. I feel well, like I understand it a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. I do appreciate that. Uh, so this is interesting. I did want to just show you this. We just updated it. So this is over the course since 2014. Um, looking at the average, what the county has told us is our average residential home value of $100,000, what their property tax has been. So if you, only, if you simply look between 2014 and 2020, I believe it's an $8 difference. Um, I will tell you that last year our levy went up 3.8%. If we applied the 3.8% to the 433 from last year, that would have been $449. But again, because our tax base increased, it keeps the individual properties amount lower. Well, thank you for the approval. Any other questions? I think we need a second, right? Yeah, yep. I'll second. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the uh, 2020, pay 2021 certified levy at the maximum. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed the same. Motion carries. Um, and that brings us to number 12 adjournment. Thank you for coming tonight. <laughs>